Hi guys, I'm Lena. Welcome to my all analog photography channel. I have a box here with something I haven't been this excited for since a while. But before we start the unboxing part, there will be two introductory stories. First of all, what is inside my box is under the Filmomat brand. So I'm expecting a lot in terms of design. In case you missed out on it, the first Filmomat product was the most beautiful, elegant, automatic processing machine Ever. A couple of weeks ago, um, I had a workshop with Leica Adox and Silvergrain Classics in the most gorgeous villa, which is the ATR Sound showroom in Eltville. And the Filmomat machine was there and it fits so perfectly into those stylish luxury interiors. I mean, we were walking around, we were afraid to touch things. I shot color slide for the first time in my life. Yeah, I, I did that. And it was processed in a Filmomat. The second story is that in every single darkroom printing workshop I ever did, there were at least two, three people uh, who would be saying, mm, you don't use the f-stop system for your test prints. But now, with the help of what's inside this box, I'm not going to be getting those comments anymore. It is an f-stop timer. Instructions. Well, that I'm going to read later. <gasps> No way. It's a foot switch. That's it. The review can be over right now. I have a foot switch. I'm super happy. That's it. I like everything else. Ah, amazing. There are no stickers. I'm so used to getting stickers. I love stickers so much. Just saying. Oh, wow. It's pretty. Oh, wow. It's heavy, but it's solid. It has those rubber feet, so it's not gonna like slide back and forth. I've seen functional f-stop timers and there is open source code for them. So people made a few prototypes and some of those prototypes are actually not that bad looking, but I've also looked at some mass produced f-stop timers, but not a single one gave me the desire to put it in my dark room. I love that the Filmomat timer has turning knobs because I just can't stand pressing buttons to change the time. In some f-stop timers, for me, it was a killer, and that's why I kind of never looked into them and never really wanted to buy them, because it's not an upgrade from what I have right now. When I see buttons, I have an allergic reaction, I guess. Okay, I think I need to read the instruction right now, because I'm really curious what this one does. This knob, it is a detent. What is a detent? I've never used it in my life, I've never seen it catch in a machine which prevents motion until released yeah no wonder i have never used this word i'm just gonna connect it to electricity now and just see what it does it's changing increments and what does this do ah that just simply changes the time in the increments so you set up the increments here and you change the time here that could have been explained a little easier i think the rest is more or less understandable so i'm just gonna go to the dark room and test it and then share with you guys my impressions back from the dark room but before we look at my results i think i should probably clarify why i'm so excited about an f-stop timer so indeed regular timers and thinking about exposure through the framework of traditional timers is somewhat well i wouldn't say unprofessional but kind of makes no sense if you think about it because everything in photography is measured in exposure stops when you shoot every setting on your camera is double or half the previous one in apertures f8 lets through twice as much light as f11 f5.6 lets through twice as much light as f8 and f.4 twice as much as f5.6 etc etc so speeds also go in increments. So with each following one, the shutter moves faster and only half the light goes 
through. ISO values are the easiest, like they're literally 1500, 200, 400, 800. Each next one is twice as sensitive as the previous one. And only in the darkroom, the f-stops of the lens remained, but the exposure speeds went their own, let's say, special way. Mainly because in the very beginning, papers were so slow, they needed, I don't know, 10 minutes of exposure time or even hours of exposure time. And then you just looked at the paper and saw at which point it looks more or less good under your negative and you washed it and you fixed it straight away. Sorry, you did not wash it. You, you, you fixed it straight away without any developer. And then, of course, those exposure times shortened and it, they moved to the enlargers, but still this linear time counting stayed. And obviously f-stop timers, they are only possible with a bit of technology behind. This situation as it is now is completely illogical from the point of view of photography, of how everything else is in photography. For example, we do a traditional test strip. Where's my traditional test strip? Here it is, yeah. Uh, don't look at this part. <laughs> this is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 seconds. I worked like this for years and it didn't really bother me and I bet most of you guys work exactly like this and it doesn't bother you. The difference between the lightest part is twice the amount of light, but between, I don't know, 20, 25 seconds, it's like 25-ish percent. And if we continue here, the difference gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have too much of a difference in the highlights and too little difference in the darker exposures. So this imperfect method got fixed in the 80s by well-known and respected printer Gene Nocon. You never know who invented which process. So I'm not going to claim he invented this because, you know, a lot of times it happens that in different parts of the world, people invent exactly the same thing, but he is the one who made it popular. He wrote a book, he provided guidelines and he came up with the entire system and he really dedicated a big chunk of his life to promoting this f-stop printing. The main benefit of the system is the ability to record dodging and burning and being able to perfectly repeat the original even when the image is enlarged. So in a regular timing way, uh, for example, my base exposure is 16 seconds and a dodge for 5 seconds. When I enlarge the print and the base exposure becomes 20 seconds, how much should I dodge? Well, I personally just divide 20 by 16, get a factor. It's 1.25 and then I multiply 5, which is my dodging time, by 125 and get my 6.2 seconds of dodging. And also in general, in my head, I worked with percentages. I want an area 20% lighter, so I just multiply the base time by 0.8. For me, the main benefit of the f-stop system is really having more informative, evenly spaced and more professional test trips which are possible to make without an f-stop timer. And there are tables for it, depending on your starting time. But I would just shoot myself pressing all those buttons on my stupid timer and not messing up one. You know, not messing up this is difficult enough because I constantly have other stuff in my head, thinking already two steps ahead and making this decent is already a challenge. And if you ask me to do those perfect f-stop test trips with a freaking table, I know there are some people who have it memorized, but then you still have to deal with your horrible timer. I don't see the benefit of it. Maybe some of you guys uh, do it with a regular timer, then let me know how you deal with it because I don't find it possible, but I don't need to suffer because I have this beautiful thing. So, Thankfully, an f-stop timer delivers exactly what I need in my work. I need boom, 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 done, next. In general, the settings for f-stop printing are more complicated, but here they are made quite easy. For a test trip, you can select half a stop, third of a stop, sixth of a stop, twelfth of a stop. And I like using one third of a stop because it's uh, just not too big, not too little. Here you select the base time, five seconds is a little bit too little. Let's select 10. 10 seconds. What this 10 second means is this will be your middle exposure and the rest will be one third stop less, one third stop more, etc, etc. But you can also do half a stop differences or up to one twelfth of a stop differences. Calculating those, if you have to do it without a timer, is really, really difficult. Here we just go to test trip mode, incremental mode, and then look. And here you have a progress bar, so you know how many you have left.
Et voilà, you made it. And without any tables, without any difficult calculations, you have a perfect test trip with perfectly spaced time. Let's say you like this time, which is one third of a stop less. And this is your final exposure. You go to exposure, you select one third of a stop here, and then you just go one third of a stop less. And that's it. You expose, and this will be your time. I was very much missing the possibility to have just five increments. If you want a proper test trip with all the seven increments, and I mean, you can't have them narrower than this, right? You won't see anything. They have to be at least two centimeters. And I would surely advise to have such a great, informative, big, nice test trip, because if you have good test trips, you make final prints just much faster. But for me, someone who can more or less just look at this at the projection of the negative and say okay at this f-stop it's more or less this many seconds and i i really do four increments maximum this is a lot but i have to say how i do things is hardly exemplary my test trips are really ugly especially compared to what i got with the film I'm at. with seven exposures to fit a paper i was kind of forced to make them really narrow, nice and even. And I came up with this cardboard with seven increments and aligned the other cardboard to them. I've never ever had such professional looking pretty test strips in my entire life. So I did two test strips because I do split filter printing and um, yeah, here is for my filter five, here is for filter two and I selected the times and by coincidence they were the same. So that was extra easy. One exposure, change filter, another exposure. That's it. I made this print. I was very happy with it. I was like, okay, that's, that's perfect. Well, it's RC paper, so nothing is too beautiful on it. And then I thought, okay, how do I work this timer with dodging and burning? And that's where I kind of experienced some difficulties. I needed to burn an extra third of a stop on top on the cloud. If I want to add one third of a stop, it's like, that's it, 7.9 seconds. Now, I have to calculate the difference between 7.9 and 6.3. How do I set it? And luckily here, if I go down, I get 1.5 seconds. So it is pretty much the same, or if I want 1.9, which is slightly more, but it's still already not precise. Another thing what you can do is you set up a longer time, 7.9 seconds. And while it's running, 1.6 seconds before it's over, you intervene with a cardboard and you dodge this part. Immediately during installation, I hit the first roadblock. The timer was beautiful, but required some space, quite some space, I have to say, which I didn't exactly have. I have space at the other enlargers, but they both are set up for other prints. Anyway, in the future, this timer is definitely going to one of the other enlargers. Uh, the cable that's going to the enlarger is behind. However, the power cable is on the side, on the left side which means there is no way to put the timer on the right. And I'm just used to having all my timers on the right. With a foot switch, it also logically goes on the left, but I guess my brain is not coordinating well and I just need to switch with my right foot. The left one doesn't get the signal from my brain fast enough. And if I use the right foot, the cable goes across the whole table. So I kick this poor switch all the time, but I think it's a matter of just adjustment. Uh, I'm, I literally spent what, two hours, one and a half hours with this uh, beautiful thing here. I think even tomorrow it's already going to be completely different. So the only thing you should consider is that with a power cable on the side, this timer is even wider. Ooh, six centimeters. So this is what you should consider. You have to have a spacious table. Another problem is that I have this glorious trasformatore and regular light bulb. It's not LED. And this timer is extra precise, but my quite vintage installation is not. With f-stop printing, you're dealing with these things like 0.3 seconds and they matter. And my IFF just cannot do it because you know, the signal just goes all the way through and then the light turns on for half a second, not really half a second, but like 0.2 seconds and then goes off and there is still light happening. 
Maybe I should empty the head and upgrade it because in the age of LED lights, it's a stone age setting, what I have right there. So bottom line, is this specific timer worth buying? Well, let's be objective. Nothing is absolutely necessary in life and even a darkroom timer is not really a must because I made all my first prints without a timer at all, just by counting Mississippi 1, Mississippi 2. If you already have a timer and it happens to be a nice one, I can't actually envy you. Darkroom timers en masse are rather unattractive and horrible to operate on top. I have one timer that I like from the usability standpoint, obviously with knobs, huh? And even that one has a somewhat already dated design. It's not very impressive, but it's okay. It's okay. Getting something that is functional, of high quality, and importantly, very stylish, because I believe that the objects that surround us form our thinking and affect our work results. So anyway, all that in one is quite rare. If not, this is the only case. But I've seen a couple of timers which were nice-ish, but competing with this one? Well, let me, let me know if you have any other timers which are as pretty as this one. If you know about any other timers, I will be actually happy to review them as well. I have Patterson timers. Yes, they're half the price of this one. I have one right here, by the way. And you know why it's here? Because it's dead. I bought it brand new. It lived I don't even know how long. And then it just collapsed. I don't know what happened. It looks completely new. It doesn't have a single scratch. It just, just died. And those buttons. I mean, those buttons. Compare. I shouldn't be too critical towards those timers because at least I have them. Here in Europe, we don't have a glorious selection. It can go back under the table until somebody maybe repairs it or I have the time to open it and look what went wrong. For this video, I even went online, looked at all of the possible timers and I even looked on eBay and the used traditional timer choices are depressing. The timer I like, this Durst Digitim 2000, is 400 euros. Yeah, I remember that getting it was um, was a challenge in general. So price-wise, this timer is, let's say, on the high side, but for what it offers, it's absolutely reasonable. There are other f-stop timers on the market too, which are priced similar or slightly lower. You may want to look into those, but in terms of design and usability, I have a definite clear preference. This is the first timer I actually like having since the prototype of my own timer, but the prototype of my own timer got buried somewhere there in my dark room in the corner. No one is using it and it's not even an f-stop timer. It's a regular one, straightforward one. And it's just somewhere there and Lucas, the guy behind Filmomite, made it happen. All my little criticisms, you can see where they come from. It's only because I've been thinking of my own timer myself a lot. I know very well how challenging, insanely challenging this is. So yeah, he gets all my support, all my respect for this product, for his other Filmomat products, other ones I don't really need, but this one I'm super happy to have gotten it for a review. I will leave all the links below the video where you can find this beautiful timer. And thank you for watching, liking, subscribing to my YouTube channel and see you in the next video. Bye.